Uh, thank you very much, Professor Suzuki, for that introduction, and thank you everybody for coming along today. Um, I am going to be talking about magnetic materials in medicine, and medicine is about keeping people healthy, and uh, being part of being healthy is keeping the fluids in your body moving so you can transport oxygen around and so on. So to that end, I notice everyone's been sitting down for at least two hours, so I want everybody to stand up, please. Everybody to stand up. Ready? I want you all to put your hands up like this. Shake them around a bit. Now we're getting on one leg and we're shaking this leg. Now the other leg. Shake that leg. Great. Now the other thing that happens is um, uh, your brain needs to be activated in different ways. You've been receiving information. I now want you to give information. So you're going to turn to your nearest neighbour and for one minute you've got to discuss either your favourite food or your favourite place in the world or your favourite musician. So you've got one minute. Please do that now. <laughs> Good, okay, that's enough. <laughs> But hopefully that's just enough to get the, the blood flowing. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay, good. Everyone feeling a bit refreshed. Um, so I am also going to just take one more minute of your time to explain a little bit more about where I come from. Um, usually when people around here ask me where I come from, I say down there. So if you dig a hole through the ground uh, and keep going in a straight line, you'll come out somewhere around about here. Um, so I live in, in, on the, in Perth, on the west coast of Australia. Uh, any of you who have been to Australia will know that most people live in this corner here. Uh, there's about 20 million people on the east coast. There's about 2 million people in Perth on the west coast. So it's um, quite an isolated city. So, some people say it's the most isolated city in the world. It takes about five hours to fly from Perth to Sydney, similar uh, time scale up to um, Singapore and Jakarta. And in the middle of Australia, there's a very large wilderness. Um, but uh, despite our isolation, we do have some of the comforts of civilization. Uh, this is the University of Western Australia, where I work. Uh, you might notice it looks a little bit like Stanford. Uh, and that's because it was the same architect who designed both campuses. Um, this is the city of Perth, a photograph taken from a hill between the university and the city. And then down at the bottom is the closest beach to the university. Um, this is the Indian Ocean, and this is a place where staff and students like to spend their weekends. So let's move on to the science. Um, we are talking about magnetic materials, and of course one of the reasons why magnetic materials are interesting is because they emanate obviously measurable fields well beyond the boundaries of the material. Um, on the right here, we've got what most people think of as a magnet when the, when the idea first comes into their head. It's a kind of inorganic substance. But today I'm going to discuss several examples of magnetic materials that are synthesized by biological processes rather than inorganic processes. And in fact, every example will be found inside the human body and synthesized by those biological processes. Now, why might we be interested in magnetic materials in medicine? This picture reminds me of some of the reasons why. First of all, we can see that magnetic fields can penetrate significant distances into the human body in a harmless way. They have no ill health effects on the body. And yet, we can use those magnetic fields to apply quite strong translational forces or rotational torques on magnetic material at a distance inside the body. Uh, we can also use magnetic fields to detect magnetic material at a distance inside the body. And as we will see later, we can also use alternating magnetic fields to heat 
magnetic material at a distance inside the body, which can all be useful. So the rest of my talk will be in two parts. I will first of all talk about naturally occurring and biologically synthesized magnetic materials that are found inside the human body. They will include uh, magnetic biomolecules and magnetic nanocrystals. And in the second half of my talk, I will cover synthetic magnetic materials. So these are the materials we make in the laboratory or by industrial processes and then use those materials in one way or another in medical uh, pro procedures. And some of the examples I will cover are magnetic hyperthermia therapy, which is a type of therapy for treating cancer. We will look at magnetically guided drug delivery, the concept here being to make drugs magnetic so that we can use magnetic fields and field gradients to concentrate the drugs in parts of the body where they are required and hence reduce their concentration in other parts of the body and hopefully reduce side effects. Then we will look at an example of a magnetic fluid uh, being developed in a diagnostic and finally magnetic traces and the concept here is to use magnetic nanoparticles in place of radioisotopes for tracking cells and fluids inside the human body. So let's start off with the naturally occurring and biologically synthesized magnetic materials and I want to uh, talk about first of all magnetic biomolecules I'm going to talk about one example, but it's the most famous example. And its history dates back to Michael Faraday in 1845. And back in 1845, um, well, first of all, let me just say that Faraday, of course, was a prolific experimental scientist who contributed a lot to what we know today about magnetic materials. And he did measure the magnetic properties of many things, including, in 1845, a sample of dried blood. And if you look at Faraday's notebooks, you will see that uh, in relation to this measurement, he made a comment to himself, which was, I must try a recent fluid blood sample. Now, it turns out that Faraday never got around to making that measurement. And it was almost 100 years later that another famous scientist, uh, Linus Pauling, who was a two-time Nobel Prize winner, he did make the measurement. And he uh, made the comment that if Faraday had made that measurement back in 1845 on fluid blood, and if he had taken blood from arteries and blood from veins and compared the magnetic susceptibility, he would have found the magnetic susceptibility to be significantly different between the two types of blood. In fact, if you take human blood and you fully oxygenate it and you fully deoxygenate it, the magnetic susceptibility is about 20% different. And this prompted Pauling to make a further comment, which is that he, he reckons that if Faraday had made the measurement, um, it would have changed appreciably the course of history on the research of blood and haemoglobin. Well, it turns out that Pauling's the guy who did make the measurement, so he gets the glory. And he showed that this magnetic susceptibility change is due to the molecule haemoglobin which is the molecule in our blood that transports oxygen around our bodies. The molecule consists of four subcomponents, and each subcomponent contains one iron atom in what's called a heme group. And this iron atom is the site in the haemoglobin molecule where oxygen molecules bind and are released. Now, when the oxygen molecule is bound to that iron site, the iron atom is diamagnetic. In other words, we can say that its magnetic properties are pretty much the same as most other atoms in the human body. But when the oxygen molecule is released, that iron atom becomes paramagnetic with a spin of two. So now its magnetic properties are significantly different from all the other atoms in the human body. And you might imagine that there could be some interesting technologies based around that effect, and there are. And the one I'm going to discuss is the most famous of these, and it's called functional magnetic resonance imaging. Now this is the type of magnetic resonance imaging that's used by brain scientists to work out how the brain works. And what they do is they get a human subject, they put them in the scanner, 
and they get that person to do a specific mental task. It could be, for example, an arithmetic calculation. Now what happens is, a part of the brain starts working hard to do that calculation, and in the process, more oxygen is utilized in that part of the brain. And as such, the magnetic susceptibility of the blood in that part of the brain will change. And so this technology is designed to detect that magnetic susceptibility change. So what you're looking at here is a scan or a picture of a human brain, and you can see some red and blue areas plotted on here. These are actually data from 20 different human subjects. And in this particular study, what these scientists were interested in is how the brain processes language or understands language. And they were particularly interested in tonal languages. These are languages such as Mandarin Chinese and Thai language. And what they did was they took 10 native Mandarin Chinese speakers and 10 native Thai speakers and they played these tones, these different words um, to them while they were in the scanner. And what they found was that for the same tones, the Mandarin Chinese people had these red parts of the brain activated, whereas the Thai people had these blue parts activated. The yellow is the overlap, which, which is hardly any. So this is quite a remarkable study, because if you think about it, we, we used to think that there was a particular part of the brain responsible for language. What we now know is it depends what language you speak as to which parts of your brain you use. And I think this is a major uh, uh, advance in our understanding of how the brain works, courtesy of magnetic materials research. Here is another example. This is the same person on the left and on the right, but doing two different mental tasks. On the left, uh, you can see that the rear of the brain is more activated, these orange areas. And on the right, you can see the front of the brain is more activated. And in this particular case, the two different mental tasks are, on the left, uh, this person is telling the truth. And on the right, you've probably guessed it, uh, this person is telling lies. Now, it turns out that uh, this technology is not 100% effective, but it's probably the best lie detector we have to date. And for your information, um, there is a company in San Diego, California, where you can go and pay $5,000 to have this test done, just in case you need that. <laughs> so let's now move on to biogenic magnetic nanocrystals. And I'm going to talk about three examples. Um, here are some electron microscope pictures of these crystals. They, are all, they all show different types of magnetic property. They are all synthesized by biological processes, and they are all found inside the human body under one circumstance or another. So let's start off with the crystals on the left. These crystals are acicular in shape. They are a few hundred nanometers long, about 50 nanometers wide, and they display paramagnetic properties. In fact, uh, they obey Curie's law perfectly. And these crystals are found occasionally inside human red blood cells. And the occasion on which they're found is after an infection with malaria. Now what happens with malaria is a mosquito can pass the parasite into your bloodstream and the parasite invades our red blood cells. Once inside the red blood cells, it eats the hemoglobin. And a waste product of that metabolism are those iron atoms that I showed you earlier. And those iron atoms in the free state are toxic to the parasite. So the parasite has evolved mechanisms to bind those iron atoms into these insoluble crystals. And because they're insoluble, it's a way of detoxifying the iron. Interestingly, many anti-malarial drugs operate by hindering the formation of these crystals so that the parasite poisons itself as it metabolizes the hemoglobin. Anyhow, a few years ago, uh, a former student of mine, Stefan Karl, asked the question, is there anything useful we can do with these paramagnetic properties? And it turns out there is. So what I'm going to do next is I'll first of all tell you what we can do with those paramagnetic properties and then I will tell you why it's useful. 
So what can we do? You can take a single droplet of infected human blood and mix it with some buffer solution and pass it through a plastic column filled with steel shot. If you place a permanent magnet either side of this column, you magnetize the steel shot, which creates strong magnetic field gradients. What then happens is, is the blood cells pass through this column and they drain out at the bottom here. But any cells that contain those paramagnetic crystals get trapped in these strong magnetic field gradients. If you then remove the magnet, you demagnetize the steel shot, you can flush out any remaining cells and capture them here. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you some optical microscope pictures of the blood cells here, here, and here. So on the left, these are the cells before they pass through the, the magnetic column. And what you can see is that most of them are uninfected, but there's one cell here that has a parasite in it. If you then look at the cells that pass through the column while the permanent magnet is in place, you can see that none of these cells have a parasite present. If we then look at the cells that are flushed out after removal of the permanent magnet, you can see that most of these cells have a parasite present. So this is a way of concentrating up cells that have the malarial parasite. Now, the one other thing I want to comment on here is that this technology is low cost. The uh, neodymium iron boron magnets cost about $100. Um, there's a simple soft iron core here, and the plastic tube with the steel shot costs just a few cents per use, and that's a disposable item. And the important point about this is that most countries that have malaria do not have much money. So the idea is this technology can be locally manufactured. So that's what you can do. Why might it be useful? I need to tell you a little bit more about malaria to explain why it's useful. You all probably know that the parasite is passed to humans by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes infect us. What's less well known is that humans infect mosquitoes with malaria. And what's um, uh, interesting is that many of the humans who infect mosquitoes are apparently healthy. Now, um, why, while we can try to prevent mosquitoes infecting humans to try and eradicate malaria, it would be equally effective, and perhaps additionally important, that we try to prevent humans infecting mosquitoes. Now, why might uh, these humans who infect mosquitoes be apparently healthy? The reason is that they may have contracted malaria in the past, or they will have contracted malaria in the past. Their bodies will have overcome the disease by, through their, their immune system, but the parasite is smart, and when it's under attack from the immune system, it can transform into another form called a gametocyte, which simply circulates in the bloodstream without causing any ill health effects. What it's essentially doing is it's waiting for a mosquito to come along, take a feed, the parasite goes into the mosquito gut, mate, mates with another gametocyte, and the offspring can then infect further humans. And this is what keeps the cycle of malaria going. So currently, that simple magnetic fractionation column technology is now being used in Papua New Guinea in clinical trials to identify people who carry that gametocyte form of the parasite and then to work out how much drug and for how long for should it be given uh, in order to eliminate that final form of the parasite. And this is, of course, the idea of working towards malaria eradication. So that's uh, the crystals on the left. Let's now look at these crystals on the right. These crystals are uh, spheroidal in shape. They are about six nanometers in diameter. They are, in fact, a type of iron oxide. And they have an antiferromagnetic structure. And they display super paramagnetic behavior. And these crystals are found predominantly in the human liver. And I hope that everybody in the audience today has some of these crystals in all of your livers. And the reason for this is that this is the natural way that we store excess iron in our bodies. And we need a little bit of excess iron because iron is difficult to gain from our diet in large quantities. And if we have an accident and bleed a lot, or let's say we lose a lot of blood during childbirth, then 
our bodies are able to remobilize the iron atoms in these crystals to make new hemoglobin quickly. However, for some people with diseases such as these listed below here, for one reason or another, these people's bodies accumulate way too many of these crystals. And under these circumstances, the crystals start to act as catalysts for chemical reactions that damage cells. And this can lead to liver fibrosis, liver cirrhosis, and eventually liver cancer and death. So doctors looking after these patients need to remove this excess iron. And for most of these diseases, the only practical way to do this is to administer a drug called an iron chelator, which can grab hold of the excess iron and enable it to be excreted. But the challenge for the doctors is getting the dose of the drug right. Because if they don't give enough drug, then the iron builds up and the iron becomes toxic. If they give too much drug, the iron becomes depleted and the drug becomes toxic. So to get the dose right, they need to measure the concentration of these nanocrystals. And the way this used to be done was through a procedure called a liver biopsy. This involves a surgical procedure that removes a small piece of liver tissue which can then be sent away for chemical analysis. The problem is that this procedure has several major complications, ranging from pain through internal ble bleeding, bile leakage, and even death from the procedure itself. So it's not suitable for repeat measurements, which is what these patients need. So to that end, in the 1980s, physicists developed a magnetic way of measuring the concentration of these crystals and they called it biomagnetic susceptometry. Its concept is quite straightforward. You build a device that has a superconducting solenoid in it so that the stray field from that solenoid can penetrate the liver region of the body. This magnetizes those iron oxide nanocrystals. In here you also have a, a flux sensor and down here is a bed that's on a stepper motor and the idea is you lower the bed at a controlled rate so that the liver moves further away from the field source and the flux sensor. So schematically it looks like this. Here's the position of the solenoid and flux sensor. Here's the liver. And then as you move the bed downwards, the liver moves further away from the field source and the sensor and you can imagine that the flux through the sensor drops off. And if you measure that flux as a function of the height of the bed and if you know the geometry of your coil um, and this flux sensor and so on and so forth, you can do a calculation to calculate the concentration of the iron oxide nanoparticles. And this technology works quite well. The problem is that the instruments cost about two million dollars each to build and install and all they can do is measure liver iron concentration. So we then looked at another way to do this using magnetic resonance imaging scanners because these scanners are available in most major hospitals around the world. They use strong magnetic fields, which can be used to magnetize those iron oxide nanoparticles. They use radio signals, which can be used to interrogate the dynamic magnetic properties of protons in the tissue. And they do not use ionizing radiation, so that it's a safe modality that can be used repeatedly. So what we did was we worked out a way to use these radio signals together with the magnetic field to measure and map the proton transverse magnetization relaxation rates in the liver. So what's going on here is if you can imagine for sake of argument that the magnetic field of the scanner is in this direction then of course protons that are magnetized in the tissue will process in that field. If you now have iron oxide nanoparticles present in the tissue, they become magnetized and at the poles of these particles, the magnetic field will be greater than the ambient field of the scanner. And hence, any protons at the poles will process faster than usual. However, at the equator of these iron oxide nanoparticles, the magnetic field is less than the ambient field of the scanner because of the demagnetizing flux and hence, the protons process slower than usual. So the presence of the iron oxide nanoparticles in the liver speeds up the rate at which the protons dephase. 
And so that's what we're measuring and mapping here. This is a cross-section through, through, through the body of a patient. And what you're looking at in here is the liver. And where the, this image is bright, this is where the protons are dephasing quickly. And where it's dark, the protons are dephasing slowly. And what we were able to show is that essentially this is a map of the concentration of those iron oxide nanocrystals. Now over on the left, what we can do is make a histogram of all the different pixel, or we call them voxel values here, because each pixel is an independent measurement. So there's typically about 7,000 measurements in this liver. And what you can then do is take the mean of this histogram as a surrogate measure for the mean concentration of those iron oxide nanocrystals. And this technology has now been commercialized as something called Feriscan. And this is how the doctors use it. They call the patient in for a scan, make a map of the iron oxide nanocrystals, and then look at this histogram. If it's shifted to the right, they know the patient's got a high iron loading. If it's shifted to the left, there's a low iron loading. And in this particular case, through a calibration, we know that the mean concentration of iron in the liver is 16 milligrams of iron per gram dry tissue. So the doctor puts the patient on these chelation drugs and then 12 months later calls the patient back for another scan and looks at the histogram. Now you can see it's shifted to the low iron range, which through a calibration we know is only 1.6 milligrams of iron per gram dry tissue. And this enables the doctor to now make a decision to reduce the dose of the drug to the patient. So this is how the technology is used. And this means that patients now no longer need to have this invasive, risky procedure. And instead, they can have a, a non-invasive scan. And I thought I would show you this map. Uh, this is a map of major hospitals around the world that have now replaced the biopsy procedure with the non-invasive scanning. And the point about this is that regulatory health authorities around the world have had to approve the technology to enable it to be used in routine clinical medicine. So that's my second example of magnetic nanocrystals. Let's move to the third example, this one in the middle. Now, unlike the first two examples, which are being used in medicine today, this one is still work in progress. But I think it's an interesting one. This crystal is a, um, a single crystal. It's about 50 nanometers in size. And it's a ferry magnet. In fact, it's Fe304. Uh, it's a single magnetic domain crystal. And this crystal was first found by a geophysicist whose name was Joe Kirschfink. And it was found in the human brain. And when this was first found, it sparked a lot of interest in the question of, can humans navigate by sensing the Earth's geomagnetic field? And the reason this question was asked is because these crystals are very similar to those found in magnetotactic bacteria, which are single-celled organisms that live in aquatic environments and can navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. It turns out that there's not really a lot of evidence that humans have this ability. Nevertheless, it sparked another interest, because most of the samples that were used, the brain samples that were used to find these crystals, were from people who died with Alzheimer's disease. And this raised the question of, can we develop technologies to find these crystals non-invasively in the human brain with a view to perhaps getting an early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? A major challenge with Alzheimer's disease is that most people diagnosed already have dementia or are dead. If we had the opportunity to diagnose early, it gives us the opportunity to administer drugs to slow down the rate of progression of the disease, which means you can then prolong the period of quality life that the patient has remaining. So to this end, um, colleagues in the UK, uh, led by Quentin Pankhurst and John Dobson uh, when he was there, set about measuring the magnetic signal from brain samples of people who had died without Alzheimer's disease, these open symbols, and with Alzheimer's disease, these closed symbols. And what they were able to show is that, yes, indeed, there is a, great, a significantly greater concentration of these crystals in people who die with Alzheimer's disease. 
What they were also able to show is that women who die with Alzheimer's disease have a significantly greater concentration than men. Now at the time, they didn't have an explanation for that. This work was published in 2008. This year, 2014, genetic scientists have shown that there is in fact a difference between men and women in the way Alzheimer's disease progresses. So there's possibly a link, a genetic link here. The other thing that um, Quentin Pankhurst and colleagues showed was that there's a relationship between the concentration of these crystals and the fraction of them that are super paramagnetic. And this possibly gives clues as to what the way these crystals are formed. And it possibly involves what's uh, an iron storage protein known as ferritin. However, this is work in progress. There's no medical application yet. But I thought I would show you this as an interesting example of a biogenic <coughs> magnetic nanocrystal. I now want to move on to synthetic magnetic materials. So these are the materials that we make by industrial processes or in the laboratory and that we can then use in medicine in, w in one way or another. And my first example is going to be magnetic hyperthermia therapy. Now hyperthermia therapy simply means therapy by heating tissue. And such therapies have been used for at least 2,000 years because the ancient Greeks recorded using hot stones to put on tumours to reduce their size. In modern medicine, we sometimes use microwaves or even ultrasound to heat tumours to try and kill them. But there's always a problem if the tumour is deeper inside the human body because you then have the difficulty or the danger of damaging the intervening tissues by transmitting the heat. So this is where magnetic hyperthermia therapy comes in. The concept is to take a magnetic material that shows some kind of magnetic hysteresis and to then somehow get that material into the tumour. If you can do that, you then have the option to apply an alternating magnetic field. And that will take the magnetic material around its hysteresis loop. And in doing so, it will generate heat in the material that is in proportion to the area inside the hysteresis loop. And hopefully this, can, this heat will then damage the tumour cells in one way or another. Now it turns out that such an approach has been developed and does already have regulatory health authority approval for routine clinical use in Europe. And the technology consists of uh, a magnetic fluid, so it's a, a fluid that contains magnetic nanoparticles, and um, a, a device for applying the alternating magnetic field. Here is a picture of the device. So you can see a patient lying in the cavity here. This device can apply an alternating field at 100 kilohertz with an amplitude up to 15 kiloamps per meter, which is around about 300 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field at the surface. And what I'm going to sh show you next in a short movie is how this technology was used in a clinical trial for treating brain tumours. So let me show you the movie. The technology is called Magfo uh, the nanotherm therapy and the company is Magforce. What they do is they make these iron oxide nanoparticles and they coat the nanoparticles in a polymer. Now the role of this polymer is to keep these particles in stable aqueous suspension but it also helps the particles to enter cells. The size of red blood cells is shown on the left here to give you an idea of the relative size of these particles uh, to the cells. Now in this trial for treating glioblastoma, a type of brain tumour, they took the suspension of the nanoparticles and injected the suspension directly into the brain tumour. This is through a needle that goes through a hole in the skull. You can see here is the tumour. They then rely on a difference in the property of cancer cells and healthy cells to keep those, that fluid in the region of the cancer cells. So here are the healthy cells on the left, cancer cells on the right, and the fluid as it is injected tends to seep between the cancer cells but not go into the healthy cells so much. The patient is then irradiated with the magnetic field. This takes the nanoparticles through their hysteresis loops and in the process generates heat 
in the magnetic nanoparticles. That heat is transferred to the liquid, which helps the liquid and the particles to enter into the cells. Further irradiation causes more heat, which is transferred to the cells, and they measured temperatures of median temperatures of 55 Celsius in these tumours, and in one patient, 85 degrees Celsius. This is enough to kill the tumour cells. Uh, the tumour then shrinks, and natural processes carry away the dead cells. Now, for this therapy, the injection of particles only needs to be done once, but the irradiation therapy can be done several times. So in this trial, they did one injection, and then the patient was brought back six times subsequently. It was twice a week for three weeks. Now, the results of this trial are this. For patients who have the standard therapy, not the magnetic therapy, after diagnosis, their median life expectancy is six months. For the patients in this trial who had the standard therapy plus the magnetic therapy, they lived for a median lifetime of 13 months. It doesn't sound great, but it's more than twice the patients who do not have the magnetic therapy. So it's on this basis that the European authorities gave approval for this therapy to be used. I thought I would also show you these pictures. This is um, uh, some MRI scans of a patient. You can see the tumour in the brain here. Interestingly, once you've injected the magnetic nanoparticles, you can no longer do MRI scans because the magnetic susceptibility of the particles is so great, it blacks out the entire image. However, you can do CT scans, which are based on using X-rays, and hence electron density is the contrast mechanism. So what you're looking at here, these white blobs, are, are actually the nanoparticles. So this technology allows the doctors to figure out where the nanoparticles are before they apply the alternating magnetic field. And these contours here are the calculated temperature rises. And the outer contour is the plus 2 degrees Celsius temperature rise. So that's magnetic hypothermia therapy in action. I want to now move on to magnetically guided drug delivery. So this is the concept of making drugs magnetic so that we can concentrate them in certain parts of the body using magnetic fields. And this technology is not available for humans yet, but there are some interesting animal studies, one of which I'm going to show you, that shows good promise. And the study I'm going to talk about is a collaborative effort between several research groups in Spain. And what they did was they took some iron oxide nanoparticles and they coated them in a molecule called dimercaptosuccinic acid. This molecule plays the role of keeping these particles in stable aqueous suspension. It also helps the particles to enter cells. And in this case, it enables the particles to bind an anti-cancer drug. And the anti-cancer drug is called gamma interferon. Now what you're looking at in these two data sets are different kinds of measurements on these particles. On the left, you're looking at dynamic light scattering measurements, which is a way of measuring the hydrodynamic size of an object in a fluid. And what this blue curve are the particles before the drug is bound. And you can see that the particles have a mean hydrodynamic size of about 80 nanometers. The pink curve is when the drug is bound and the size jumps up to about 400 nanometers. When you look at the surface charge, the zeta potential, before the drug is bound, the particles have quite a negative surface charge. After the drug is bound, the surface charge is less negative. So taken together, what this shows is that when the drug is bound, the particles start to aggregate. You might think that's a bad thing, but it's very difficult to control and direct an individual magnetic nanoparticle. It's much easier to move and direct an agglomeration of nanoparticles. And so this agglomeration of particles probably is working in favor of this particular technology. So what they did was they then did an animal study where they took two groups of mice and they injected tumor cells into the right-hand flanks of the mice. And for one group of mice, they took a permanent magnet and they placed that magnet against the tumor site. They then took the suspension of the iron oxide nanoparticles with the gamma interferon drug bound and they injected that 
into the tail veins of the mice. And for the group of mice that had the permanent magnet in place, they left that magnet in place for one hour after the injection and then removed it. So that's the therapy. And that therapy was carried out four times on these mice. It was twice a week for two weeks. What I'm going to show you in the next slide are the results of this animal trial. What you're looking at are the tumours extracted from the mice subsequent to the therapy. The top row are the tumours extracted from the mice that had the permanent magnets put in place. The bottom row are the tumours from the mice that did not have the permanent magnet put in place. So what you can see is by placing the magnet against the tumour, the tumour was hindered from growing so much. And this is presumably because the drug has been concentrated in the region of the, the growing tumour. Now, as I mentioned, this technology is not available for humans yet, but there are several envisaged applications where this approach could be used. I don't have time to talk about them now, but if we have time at questions, maybe we can discuss that. I do want to actually now move on to an example of using a magnetic fluid. Um, and this is work from our lab again. And in this case, the fluid's being used for a diagnostic. And the disease that we're looking at is schistosomiasis, which is sometimes called Bilharzia. This disease is very prevalent in Africa, but is also found in some parts of South America and some parts of Asia. And it's a parasitic disease. And it's the second most serious parasitic disease worldwide after malaria. And like malaria, it uses an intermediate animal host to infect humans. And in this case, the intermediate animal host is a freshwater snail. Now the parasite lives in the snail and at a certain part in its life cycle, it emerges from the, the snail and starts to swim through the fresh water. After that, it has an interesting life cycle. Here's the life cycle. The snail is here. Here's the parasite swimming through the fresh water. And if during its swim, it encounters a human host, it is able to penetrate the skin of the human host. So here you can see some small dots. These are the entry points where the parasite has gone in. Once inside the human body, it swims through blood vessels and tries to find a blood vessel near the bladder or the intestines or the liver. And there it settles down and matures into a worm. And the worm looks like this on the right. Now, um, what you're looking at here is a male worm. Uh, but what you can also see in this picture is a female worm. This is the male worm. The female worm is here. She lives in a small groove inside the male worm. And this pair of worms can live inside your blood vessels and directly do not cause you any ill health effects. But, as a pair, they lay about 1,000 eggs per day. And the eggs look like this. They are around about 100 microns in size, and they have the uncanny ability to migrate through human tissue. And some of these eggs find their way into the human liver, where they settle down and they stimulate liver fibrosis, uh, liv liver cirrhosis, and eventually liver cancer, which leads to death. Or they can also weaken blood vessels and cause them to burst, which can also cause death. The other eggs migrate into the intestine. And there's a reason they do that. They are relying on the human host living in an area of poor sanitary conditions. If the feces that uh, uh, come out from the intestine of that patient reach fresh water, on contact with fresh water, the eggs hatch. And once the eggs hatch, the parasites can swim through the water and they find some more snails and the life cycle starts again. The challenge for the medical community is diagnosis. Currently, the way the diagnos diagnosis is done is using something called a fecal smear test. This involves taking a sample of the patient's feces. This is smeared on a glass microscope slide. And then you ask a parasitologist to look at the slide and try and find the eggs, the 100 micron sized eggs. The problem is that uh, there can be as low as one egg per gram of feces. So this is a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Many, many positive cases are missed. 
So some colleagues of mine in Brazil um, started looking at a better way to find these eggs. I don't have time to tell you the full story of what they did, but they had a suspicion that these eggs might be magnetic. And that's where we were brought in, because they knew about our malarial work, and so we wondered if we could use the same method of using the magnetic column to try and find these eggs. Well, it turns out that the eggs are slightly magnetic, um, but the column method doesn't work, partly because the eggs are not quite magnetic enough, and partly because the medium in which these eggs are found tends to clog up the columns. And so what we did was we looked at another way to do this. We looked at using something called the Magneto-Archimedes effect. Now, if you remember, the Archimedes effect uh, was discovered by, by Archimedes when he was in his bath. And he jumped out uh, and ran down the street naked, shouting, Eureka! And because what he had discovered was that if you put an object in a fluid, it displaces gravitational mass in the gravitational field of the Earth, and hence the object experiences a buoyancy force. If you make the fluid a magnetic fluid, it also displaces magnetic moment in a magnetic field. And so there's another kind of Archimedes force. And if you uh, set up a geometry like this, where you have two permanent magnets opposed to each other, you put a, a chamber of magnetic fluid in between, you can then put an object into that fluid, it will experience the force of gravity downwards, the normal Archimedes force upwards, but then another Magneto-Archimedes force, which in this geometry is upwards in the bottom half of this chamber and downwards in the top half of the chamber. And this enables you to do a demonstration like this. You can take two magnets opposed to each other, a chamber of paramagnetic fluid, you can put in, let's say, a diamagnetic object, such as a polycarbonate disc, and it will levitate at a certain height in this chamber. And the height at which it levitates is dependent on the magnetic susceptibility of the object, the density of the object, the magnetic susceptibility of the fluid, and the density of the fluid. And so what we thought was if we could, what we did, we measured the magnetic susceptibility of the schistosoma eggs, we measured the density of the schistosoma eggs, which enabled us to then work out a recipe for a fluid that would have the right density and magnetic susceptibility to make the eggs levitate at a specific height in the chamber. And the idea is that a doctor could then take a sample of the faeces, mix it with this fluid, and then put it between the two magnets so that the eggs would be found at a particular position in this chamber and the rest of the faecal matter driven to either the top or the bottom of the chamber depending on its magnetic and uh, density properties. So we set about testing this in mice. And this technique does work for mouse faeces. Here, here you can see some schistosoma eggs uh, levitated in the chamber, and the, mouse fe the rest of the mouse fecal matter is driven to the bottom of the chamber. So, of course, we were then interested to know what happens with humans. And um, you may know that this year the IEEE Magnetic Society Graduate Summer School was held in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So I went to that um, uh, school, which was very interesting, and then after the school, I went down to the south of Brazil, to Rio Grande do Sul, to meet up with my colleagues, uh, Professor Carlos Gref Teixeira and Dr. Renata uh, Russo Candido. And we've now just started the trials on human feces. And it's looking good. We, we definitely, the eggs are separating out, um, but we do need to design the chamber a little bit bigger for, for the human feces. So I will have to report back to you the results of that when I see you next year, hopefully. So that's work in progress. My final example today is going to be magnetic tracers. And the concept here is to replace radioisotopes with magnetic nanoparticles for certain medical procedures where you want to track fluids or cells in the human body. Now, why would you want to do this? Um, there are a few reasons. If you're going to inject radioisotopes into a human, you want the half-life to be short, for obvious reasons. But this introduces logistical problems, because you have to get the isotope and the patient into the clinic at the same time. If either one of them is late, you run into problems. There are also uh, legal requirements around radio radioisotopes, which adds to the cost of their transport and storage. Magnetic nanoparticles have neither of those problems. 
There are other differences between detection of nanoparticles and radioisotopes. Radioisotopes are detected with a 1 over r squared characteristic. Magnetic nanoparticles are detected at a with a much shorter range characteristic, which you might think is a disadvantage. But in the example I'm going to show you, it was found that in fact it was an advantage, not a disadvantage. And the example I'm going to discuss is related to breast cancer. So what I need to do first is I'm going to show you a short movie to explain some of the biology of breast cancer. And then I will tell you about the technology. The human breast has a series of lymph vessels that carry lymph fluid away from the front of the breast towards the upper armpit. This is an important part of the body's immune system. This, this lymph fluid carries immunological cells and fluids. You can also see here these things called lymph nodes. They have a filtering property and they are able to filter out impurities and certain cells. If a patient has a breast tumour, cancer cells can break away from that tumour and get into the lymph vessels where they are transported to other parts of the body, which causes cancer metastases, which are dangerous. These lymph nodes, because of their filtering property, tend to capture some of those cancer cells. And as such, doctors are very interested to know whether or not, once they've diagnosed the tumour, the question, is there or is there not uh, a cancer cell present in these lymph nodes, these first or sentinel lymph nodes? If there are cancer cells present in these lymph nodes, unfortunately it says that the cancer is starting to spread and this means that a very large resection of the breast needs to be carried out to minimize the chance that cancer will spread to other parts of the body. If, on the other hand, there are no cancer cells found in these first sentinel lymph nodes, this is good news. Only a small surgical operation then needs to be done to remove the tumor. And this results in a much better quality of life outcome for the patient. So the question is, how do we find where these sentinel lymph nodes are? Normally this is done with radioisotope tracking. But uh, a team in London, uh, led by Quentin Pankhurst and colleagues, developed a magnetic method for finding these sentinel lymph nodes. The technology involves magnetic nanoparticles and a handheld magnetic susceptometer. And this is how it works. Let me show you another movie. About 20 minutes before the sentinel lymph node biopsy is carried out, the doctors take a, magnetic, a fluid of the magnetic nanoparticles and inject it into the nipple region of the breast. They then wait some time for these particles to diffuse through the tissue and then they massage the tissue to help those particles enter into the lymph vessels. Once the particles get into the lymph vessels, the natural flow of the lymph fluid carries the particles towards the sentinel lymph nodes. And because of the filtering properties of these lymph nodes, the magnetic particles get trapped and so the lymph nodes become regions of high magnetic susceptibility. This is where the handheld magnetic susceptometer comes in. It operates at about 20 kilohertz with a 3 millitesla amplitude. What the doctor does is first of all place it against a non-magnetic part of the body to balance or calibrate the natural diamagnetism of the human body to get a zero reading. If the detector is taken away you'll see the reading jumps up because there's no diamagnetism. Then the detector is traced along from the front of the breast along the path of the lymph vessels. Here's a low reading. When the detector is over a, uh, a lymph node, you get a higher reading. Then what the do doctors discovered is that if you use this pushing in and out motion, because of that short range detection, the reading jumps up and down as you push in and out. This gives a very confident uh, location of the lymph node. And this enables the doctors to then mark uh, that point on the skin so that they can then do some uh, a cut to open up the skin to find the lymph nodes. They continue to use the susceptometer by putting it into the open hole and now you can see a huge reading because you're getting much closer to the lymph nodes. The brown color of the magnetic nanoparticles also stains the lymph nodes 
slightly, which enables them to be more easily identified. They, they are then surgically extracted. This procedure is repeated. If the reading is still high, that's an indication there's still another lymph node to be found. That's extracted. Uh, once again, the procedure is repeated until a low reading is obtained. That gives indication that all of the lymph nodes have been found in that region, so the wound can be closed up. And as a reminder, those sentinel lymph nodes that have been extracted are then sent away to the pathology laboratory where the pathologist looks to see if there are cancer cells present. And if there are no cancer cells present, then this is very good news and only a small surgical operation needs to be carried out. So what we've done today is we've looked at various examples of magnetic research that's led to new medical technologies. Several of these technologies now already have regulatory health authority approvals to enable them to be used in routine clinical medicine. They include both high-tech approaches and low-tech approaches. And what I would like to emphasize is that these are just some examples of what's on the horizon. There are two international conferences now, that, or series of conferences, that are held in alternate years that attract many scientists who are working in this field. And I think we're going to see many more examples coming to fruition over the next few years. And so with that, it just leaves me to thank you very much for your attention today. Yeah, um, well, uh, I, I guess that there is a, hu a huge number of people in the same category as you. Um, I think there are many uh, ways cancer can be um, created. I mean, for example, we know that there are some people have genes that make them more susceptible to cancer. We know that toxins can induce cancer. Uh, we know that radiation can induce cancer. So one way or another, um, the the normal mechanisms that keep cells in balance, in other words, I don't know if you've heard about programmed cell death. This is where cells, healthy cells, not only do they grow, but they also know when to die at the right point. Um, cancer cells seem to lose that ability for one reason or another, and they proliferate when they shouldn't. And so the, this is a, the main area of cancer research, is what what are the mechanisms that go wrong to uh, start inducing that um, prolif proliferation of cells that should not be there? Yes. So when you start learning a different language, then the different part of the brain. <coughs> so that means our brain, a particular portion of the brain, is so much limited in functioning or, 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 or activating for other parts of the brain. That's very yep. quite the <coughs> I think this is what is now understood in brain science, is that you can train different parts of the brain to take over new function. So for example, if someone has a brain injury, they can temporarily lose uh, certain abilities. But over time, they can learn to uh, at least partially regain some of those abilities by using a different part of the brain. So the brain is very plastic in that sense, it seems. Mm. The controls. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, well, I, I, I think I must have that injury already. I never lie. Thank you.